Bibles this morning to James chapter 4, towards the end of your Bible, or after the book of Hebrews, James chapter number 4. The title of the message is Four Humbling Truths to Remember in 2019. As we go into a new year, the Word of God reminds us of some things that we need to keep in thought throughout the year. The humbling truths that the writer here, James, brings to our attention here in James chapter number 4. Let's go ahead and stand for the reading of the Word of God this morning, James chapter 4. We'll begin reading God's Word in verse 13, James 4.13. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell, and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, and all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your precious word this morning. Thank you for these challenging truths that are in your word for us to take heed to, to listen to, to remember throughout this new coming year. Father, as we enter into a new year as a church, help us, Father, that we would be found faithful in your sight, that we would live lives that reflect the truth of the gospel and that glorify you as our Savior. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be glorified in the proclamation of your word. Stir up your people to live with your priorities in our daily lives. Help us, O oh God, as we look into your word. Bless the teaching of your truth. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. There was a campaign a couple of years ago by an atheistic organization called the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Uh, they like to term themselves free thinking, which has become more popular than something negative like atheism. Free thinking basically means freedom from the idea that there is a creator and that secondly, we are accountable to that creator. And what they have done, this organization, Freedom From Religion Foundation, is that they put up many billboards throughout major cities around the United States of America. And they would put up these billboards. A man would say, for example, on the billboard with large letters, a picture of his face, and then it would say, science is my co-pilot. Sort of a mockery of those who say that Jesus is my co-pilot, which is bad, probably bad theology and bad bumper sticker anyways. And then you have another billboard, and it has a group of teenage girls there, and it says, we put all our faith in science. Another one has a mother there, and she says on the billboard, I don't need a higher power to have a higher purpose. And she's there with her baby. Another one is a picture of a man who says, I write fiction. I don't believe it. And then another one was a truck driver. And next to the picture of this truck driver on the billboard, it said, I'm saved from religion. Another one was another man who looked very intelligent. He had his glasses on. And he said, reason over dogma, always. And of course, he was very dogmatic about it. A retired man says next to his, his billboard, we've got the whole world in our hands. That pretty much summarizes their beliefs. It is my world, not God's world. The world is in my hands, not in the Creator's hands. 
and I determine what is right and wrong, what should be done and shouldn't be done because I am the master of my own fate. I am my own creator, sort of the thinking. Free thinking in reality is nothing more than defiant thinking as found in Romans chapter 1, where Paul gives a description of sin's effect upon mankind. It tells us that they suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. From since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even His eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. So the Bible says that God does not believe in atheists. In other words, all men have an innate understanding and belief in God. They just suppress it in unrighteousness and in sin. And God's given that evidence in their conscience because they know right and wrong, and God as the God, the lawgiver, gave them that law, and they see it and creation, the reality of a sovereign creator. But the truth be known, it isn't philosophical atheists outside of churches that are the main problem. The problem is practical atheists within Christian churches all around our country. The practical atheist attends church, states he or she believes in God. But when it comes to the decisions that are made Monday through Saturday, simply godless. The practical atheist, when it comes to decisions of life like, who do I marry? Where do I work? What's my role in marriage? How should I parent? How much time should I devote to my young children? How should I use my money? Where should I live? What should I listen to? What should I watch? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The practical atheist simply makes decisions without consulting God and His Word, assuming they have all the wisdom necessary to handle life on their own. Ladies and gentlemen, practical atheism is living, thinking, and deciding all decisions without consulting God and His Word for guidance. After all, we already know everything. This is the mentality of practical atheism. Why would a person be a practical atheist, though he is verbally a professing believer? Well, two reasons. Uh, Number one, they may not be genuinely converted. Just because a person goes to church doesn't mean necessarily they are saved. This is why the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 wrote to the church in Corinth and told those church members, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves except you be reprobate. He challenged them to test the reality of your faith in Jesus Christ. Is it real? Have you been converted truly by the grace of God? It could be that, or it could be simply that a person has been saved by the grace of God, but they are so affected by the world that they they end up living a self-absorbed, self-centered, disobedient, worldly life. And they never can see their own sin because they're too busy looking at everybody else's sin. And like stinky breath, we notice on everyone else except ourselves. So it could be that a person is just a true Christian, but he's backslidden. He's being conformed to the world. This is why he's becoming practical atheist. Let us look into the mirror of God's Word and see where we are individually at. Our text this morning, James describes and then he challenges and calls to repentance professing believers that are living worldly lives. They're living like practical atheists, like they are the masters of their own fate. They are God. We begin here in Verse 13, James says to these Jewish believers, Go to now, ye that say, that is, they are continually saying, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Now when he says here, go to now, it means come now, or it's a way of getting someone's attention and saying, Listen up now, I'm speaking to you, plural. He's speaking specifically to Jewish believers. We know that in James chapter 1. In the first few verses, he is addressing the Jews that have been been scattered in what is referred to as the diaspora. They have been scattered among the nations of the world. They no longer live in the nation of Israel. Those Jews that lived in Israel, most of them were farmers. But most of the Jews who were scattered in other countries... 
in order to survive, ended up, ended up becoming involved in businesses. In fact, for thousands of years, since the days of Daniel, there was a Jewish presence, presence in places like Iran. They had lived there for many years, and so the Jews who had been scattered had gotten involved in business and in commerce, which is nothing bad in and of itself. But they were this business and living for money was overwhelming them, and James is writing to them because they profess to be believers in the Lord, but they're living godless lives, and so he's addressing them. These Jewish believers all over the Roman empires who are seeking to make good business transactions, good business connections. They were good at it, and they were shrewd in it. He tells them, this is what you're saying continually. Today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. In other words, they have a fully developed plan for their future. They have the whole thing settled down in detail. They know how the whole year is going to go. They're assuming that they're in control of the coming year. They assume that this year that is coming is in their hands. Their language here, what they're continually saying, has the fact that they're very self-assured, self-confident. Right? You should be self-confident and self-assured. Isn't that the wisdom that we see pasted all over Facebook? Well, maybe we need to get our wisdom from the Word of God and not from Facebook. And so the idea here, these men, they're, 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 they're self-confident, self-reliant, self-assured that the future holds great prosperity for them in the coming new year. The whole year from their mindset was at their disposal. They gave no thought to the fact that their life, their breath, their everything, their business was dependent upon the Lord who's truly in control. The goal of traveling and trading and doing business was to make money. Money obviously is not evil, but the love of money is the root of all types of evil. When money and gain becomes an obsession, it easily becomes Instead of something to be used, it ends up becoming an idol in a person's life. For James, the fatal defect in their planning of these Jewish believers was the presumptuous self-centeredness. They, 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 they reasoned about the future to the exclusion of God. Who needs God in the Bible when you have great business sense? Who needs God in the Bible when you know exactly how the future is going to be? This is their understanding they were guilty of living a life of practical atheism. Now, if you were to ask them, do you believe in God? Oh, yes. Do you believe in the Lord? Oh, yeah. Do you believe in the Bible? Oh, yeah, I have a copy somewhere at home. D do you consult it in all your decisions? Of course not. Only on Sunday. <laughs> they were practical atheists. When we try to fit the Lord in our plans, and after we have made our own plans, this is the mentality that they had. One preacher put it this way, it is practical atheism to live without serious reference to God's will. I think of the psalmist David in Psalm 39 when he prayed, Lord, make me to know my end and the measures of my days that I, know, that I may know what it is, that I may know how frail I am. He doesn't pray, Lord, make me to know how wonderful I am. Make me to know how great I really am. That's not what he prays. Lord, help me to realize my life is in your hands. And help me to realize how weak I am and how I'm dependent upon you for each single heartbeat and breath in this world. With this background, James brings us some important truths that we need to remember as we enter into a new year. The first is this. You need to remember in 2019, number one, life's uncertainty. Life's uncertainty. Look at the first phrase of verse 14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. What is he saying? He's, James is writing these professing believers who are out there doing business and simply not, they're not necessarily living evil lives. They're not murdering anybody. They're not ripping anybody off. They're just godless. God really has no 
God has nothing to say to them on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or Saturday. And when he says, whereas you know not what should be on the morrow, he's saying, you know absolutely nothing about tomorrow for sure. The word know has the idea of accurate knowledge, sure knowledge about tomorrow. You don't know anything accurately and surely about tomorrow because tomorrow is not in your hands. Tomorrow is in the hands of God. He says, what is your life? What sort of life do you have? The duration of your life is filled with uncertainty. Now, the first phrase of verse 14 comes from Proverbs chapter 27, verse 1. And James's Jewish audience will be familiar with the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs talks a lot about wisdom. Not just knowing, knowing, oh, I know, I know. No, wisdom, where you actually take the Word of God, you understand it, and you actually apply it to the way that you live. That's wisdom before God. And in Proverbs 27, verse 1, the Word of God tells us, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day will bring forth. Don't brag about tomorrow is in your hands. You don't even know what tomorrow holds for you. Only God knows that. See how confident they were? We will go into such a city for a year, and there we will buy and sell and get gain. How do you know you'll be there a year? Oh, I just know. How do you know that? God holds tomorrow. It's, from God's point of view, tomorrow is certain. From our point of view, it's uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen. This is sort of the attitude that these Jewish believers had. It's very similar to the attitude of the rich farmer in Jesus' parable in Luke 12. In Luke 12, Jesus was preaching, and a man interrupted Jesus. Lord, have my brother divide the inheritance with me. In other words, he wants some money. He wants Jesus to help. After all, you, want, you need to get God on your side. No, are you on God's side? Not is God on your side. But he interrupts Jesus' sermon. That's not a good thing to do. Jesus turns and uses this man's love for money as an example to preach. And so our Lord says to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life does not consist in the things that he possesses. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? For I have no room to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, he loves himself. He'll, I'll say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. You got it made for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. Time to celebrate. From man's point of view, this guy, this, this rich farmer, man, he had it made. Man, what a guy. He's on Fortune 500 magazine cover. But then God speaks. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be that thou hast provided? From man's point of view, he had it made. He was wise from God's point of view because he lived like a practical atheist. From God's point of view, he was a fool. And this is James's audience. They're planning out their future with no concern about God or his will. Life is not uncertain to God. It is uncertain to us. Whereas you know, whereas you know not what shall be in the morrow, you know nothing about tomorrow. You know nothing about tomorrow. We know nothing about the coming new year. We're not guaranteed life in 2019 to continue on this earth for any one of us. We're not sure about health or sickness. We're not sure about getting in a car wreck or not getting in a car wreck. We're not sure what trials await us or if any. We don't know if we're going to prosper in this coming new year. None of that do we know for sure. That's uncertain to us. But yet, this audience that James is writing to they knew everything that was going to happen. They, they had the whole year planned out with no concern or reference to God. 
We need to be humbly dependent on the Lord. You need to remember in 2019 that life is filled with uncertainty. But not only that, the second part of verse 14, you need to remember 2019, life's brevity. Life's brevity. Or as you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time, and then it vanishes away. A vapor. How long does a vapor last? This is like a mist. This is, this is what I seen last night when I walked out around 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. It was so cold. First thing I did when I got out there with my jacket, I went, oh. as I did that, I saw my breath come out. I said, man, it's cold. That's how I measure coldness. If I can see my breath, it's really, really cold. If I can't see my breath, then no need for a jacket. So I go out there, oh, and I see my breath. And I only see it for around, oh, I don't know, a second? And then it's gone. This is what James says is our life. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears. It makes an appearance for a little time, and then it vanishes away. It's like that steam that comes when you boil water. It goes up, you see it, and then it's gone. It's gone. Throughout the Bible, there are various metaphors that apply to how short life is. The brevity of life. Our life is compared to an evening shadow in Psalm 102, 11. In Job 7, 7, our life is compared to a breath. You see it and then it's gone. In Job 7, 9, our life is compared to a cloud. You see a beautiful cloud formation? You're sure it's not going to be there tomorrow. It's going to be gone soon. All of these metaphors in Scripture indicate how short how brief life on this earth is. We, in our culture, we, we have birthdays and we celebrate. We count our years at each birthday. Yet God says in Psalm 90, we're to count each day. We're to count each day. The number of our days, oh Lord, teach me to number my days and to apply my heart unto wisdom, Moses prayed to God. Since life is so brief, we cannot afford to merely spend our lives, certainly not to waste our lives. We must invest our lives in that which is eternal. God reveals His Word, His will in His Word, yet most people ignore their Bible. In the Bible, God gives precepts, principles, and promises to guide our decision-making in life. And we only have a short life to serve the Lord. An unknown writer captured well the way that life slips through our fingers when he wrote, When as a child I laughed and wept, time crept. When as a youth I dreamed and talked, time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. Soon I shall be passing on, time gone. Pastor James Merritt said, Death can come at any time by design, by decay, by disease, or by disaster. Time is short. Now, I didn't think that way, by the way. I remember in high school. I really didn't apply myself in high school to studying. Thank God I passed and so graduated. But I remember in high school sitting in class, and I would look at the clock, and, and, the, and the, it was ticking like this. Tick, talk. Oh, it was so long in class. I couldn't wait to get out of school. It just... Oh, it was like torture, like someone was just scratching on the board. Eee, just, oh, the time was so slow. But now I think, man, time has gone by really fast. Once you hit 40, man, it goes super fast. <laughs> time is flying. Jerome Irving Rodale was a health food nut before the, two, the term was even invented. In 1942, he found the Organic Farming and Gardening magazine. He began talking about the virtues of chemical-free food. This is before they had organic chicken or chicken's exercise before he butchered them. He was featured on the cover of New York Times Sunday Magazine in 1971. This man was labeled the guru of organic food. He said several times, I'm going to live to be 100 unless I'm run down by some sugar-crazed taxi driver. The day after the Time story was published, 
Rodale appeared as a guest on the taping of the Dick Caveat show in New York. He was extolling the virtues of healthy eating and food supplements and exercise and, and you know, just going on and on. And then all of a sudden, he just fell asleep in the chair. They looked at him, they looked at him, they looked at him, they realized he just died. Right in the chair, died of a heart attack. This happens over and over again. We see this every year. We're shocked when someone passes away. We're shocked. We're shocked. We have people, I think, of a, in 2017, a woman by the name of Rebecca Berger, 33 years old, a fitness blogger, totally into fitness, very healthy. 27. Or 33, I'm sorry, 33 years old. And of all the, what happened is she took a pressurized canister of whipped cream and opened it and it exploded on her and killed her. Who would have guessed that she would, that, that, that everyone says, of course, that whipped cream is no good for your health, but who would have thought it's deadly and it would take her life? And it did. I think of another man by the name of Pin Fang. He is a Chinese cook in China. Very nice restaurant. I guess they're one of their delicacies is that they have cobra soup. You say, well, he must got bit by the cobra. This is what he did. They actually took out the cobra. He chopped off his head, chopped off the rest in pieces. He came back 20 minutes later after he cut off the cobra's head, grabbed the cobra, and it bit him. <laughs> and the poor guy died 20 minutes after he cut off the head of the cobra. The cobra bit him and killed him. If you want to know how brief life can be, all you have to do is take a few moments and walk in the children's section of the Delano Cemetery. Life is brief. One day I'm going to serve the Lord. Listen, God doesn't guarantee you tomorrow. This is the day. Time is brief. I don't know how, much, how long we have to live for God. In heaven, you cannot witness to anybody. Everyone's saved. It is on earth when we can serve the Lord and be a witness for Christ. Life is brief. You need to remember 2019, life's brevity. But not only that, Scripture tells us you need to remember in 2019 God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. Verse 15. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Let me back up and remind you that the problem was not that businessmen were making business plans and God is against planning. Nor is the problem is that they were capitalists engaging in business to make a profit. That is not a problem. Planning in the Bible is commended in Scripture to plan and to prepare as much as we can for the future. Financial planning is good stewardship if it's done in dependence upon God according to biblical priorities. It is a wise thing for a husband or a wife to have life insurance. And if they pass away, that their family will be taken care of. It's a wise thing to plan as best as we can financially for the future. It is a wise thing to have a will or a living trust. The Bible commends to us hard work. In fact, the Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. So the Bible is really pro-work, working hard and using your mind to plan financially. The problem that James hits was this. They were making plans and they were making them like they were in control Instead of making plans and understanding that God's in control of the future, you and I are not in control of the future. God is sovereign. They were arrogantly making plans for their future financial security, but their plans did not include God. And James says, you ought to say, if the Lord will. If the Lord will presupposes our utter, total dependence upon God for everything. Every aspect of our lives depends on God's will. If the Lord wills means this. If God doesn't will it, it's not going to happen. Say, well, I'm just determined. I'm just determined to do this. And no one can stop me. God can stop you. He can use a little piece of steak and choke you out. <laughs> God can stop anyone. If the Lord wills. Pastor R. Kent Hughes wrote, So pervasive is our culture's arrogant in." independence of God, that even many Christians attend church, marry, 
choose their vocations, have children, buy and sell homes, expand their portfolios, and numbly ride the currents of culture without substantial reference to the will of God. Now, the mere saying, if the Lord wills, doesn't mean you're submissive to God. Oh, I said if the Lord wills, that means I'm not necessarily. Saying the words, they're not magic. There's no abracadabra in the Bible. Oh, I said if the Lord wills, is it? Listen, to be accurate here, there are two aspects to God's will. There is God's will, his decreed will as seen in Ephesians 1. And there is God's prescribed will as found in the Bible. God's decreed will is called also his secret will because we don't know it. It's what it, God has determined before time began. All things happen according to his will in this universe. God decreed it to happen. That's why it will happen. As king of the universe, God decreed everything that would happen. And we're ignorant of it until it happens. We don't know what it is. It's secret. What did... Who's the Antichrist? God decreed there's going to be an evil man that is an Antichrist. And who is he? I have no idea. God knows who that is. He's decreed what's going to happen before Christ comes back. All that is decreed and secret until it happens in time. That's God's decreed will. What I'm to live by is God's prescribed will in the Bible. That's God's prescribed will for me to go by in life. God's decreed will, I don't know what that is. It just I find out as it happens in time. God's prescribed will is in the Bible. So to live according to the will of God is not to live fatalistic. Are you going to read your Bible today? If the Lord wills. What does that mean? If it's God's will, oh, your Bible will come floating to you oh, and open up. Oh, I guess it's God's will. No, it's not that spooky. It's in the word of God. That's God's prescribed will for you. Those are the precepts that you are to live by. So it's not enough to say, oh, if the Lord wills. Yes, if the Lord wills. And what you know of his will, and the only thing you know of his will, is in the Bible. In the word of God. But these Jews were not doing that. They were boasting about how they controlled the future. Look at verse 16. But now you rejoice in your boastings. And all such rejoicing is evil. The word rejoice means to boast, to brag. A little member called our tongue brags about how great we are, how important we are, how the world needs us. You know what's going to happen? When finally my time comes and my heart stops and I die. You know what's going to happen to Christianity? Nothing. God's kingdom will continue to be expanded. <laughs> That's the same thing will happen. I remember John MacArthur giving an illustration of that. He says, here's a powerful pastor. Put your hand in that bucket of water. Now take it out of that bucket of water. You see the hole that's left? Yes. No. Well, that's not the hole you'll leave. <laughs> God is not dependent upon us. We are dependent upon him. And yet they're rejoicing like they control the future. And all such rejoicing, review, uh, it, it, it exposes the pride in their heart. Proverbs 16.5 reminds us, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Think about your life. What is your aim? What is your ambition? What are you passionate about? Is it to make as much as you can, get as high as you can in the corporate ladder and take pride in yourself? I think of President Johnson delivering a speech in 1965 that became known as the Great Society Speech. As he spoke, people would break out in applause and clap for the president. He would just wait for them to finish and very dignified and go on and speak. One of his supporters came to him and said, Mr. President, they applauded you 79 times. I said, young man, they applauded me 80 times. I counted. <laughs> Here is a man that just lived for the praise of men. Rejoicing, thinking they control life when they don't. All such rejoicing, bragging about how important we are, is sin for reveals the pride in our heart. Especially when it comes to business life. In fact, these men are businessmen that are addressed here. God is sovereign over your business life. Jesus is Lord of all of life. 
from the boardroom to the bedroom, over all things, He is Lord. And we must recognize His sovereignty in all areas. You need to remember in 2019, fourthly, your responsibility. Verse 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Humble obedience to the revealed will of God in Scripture is the only sane course to take. Not to live like the practical atheist, but to live in humility and dependence upon God and upon His revealed will in the Bible. James is telling these merchants that they should know what they should do, that is, honor God in every area of life, including their business practices. Jesus is to be Lord. In a broader sense, this applies to all the commands and admonitions that James has given in his book. If you know that this is right, and this is what God has commanded, not to do good in God's sight is sin. So there are sins of commission and sins of omission. It's sort of like that Sunday school class with little boys in it. The teacher got up to ask the boys, the little boys, a theological question. He said, class, what are the sins of omission? Little Johnny in the front said, ooh, 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 ooh. I know, I know, I know. All right, Johnny, what is it? Teacher, the sins of omission are the sins that we should have committed, but we didn't. No, <laughs> they're not the sins you should have committed. There are no sins that you should commit. We can do wrong by doing wrong, but we also can do wrong by not doing what is right. An example of this is Jonah. Jonah knew God's will. Oh, what is God's will? I don't know. No, he knew it. God's word came to Jonah. Go to the city of Nineveh and preach that in 40 days judgment will fall. Go preach God's word to the Assyrian capital Nineveh, these wicked Anti-Semitic people, go preach the word. And Jonah, a man who loved God and loved his people very much, thought, I don't want to go preach to them. God may spare them and save them. It's like asking a, a Jewish rabbi to go try to witness to the Nazis for God can spare them. He doesn't want to do that. Jonah's upset. He doesn't want to do God's will and preach to the Ninevites, so he goes the opposite direction from God's will. He jumps on a boat and goes to Tarshish, modern-day Spain. He flees from God, and you can't run from God. He knows God's will, but he's not going to do it. But God is going to have the final say. He causes a storm to come, and, and Jonah is asleep in the boat, and the sailors think they're going to die. They begin to cry out to God to have mercy on them. And they ask Jonah, man, who are you? I'm a Hebrew, and I serve the living God of heaven and earth, and that made the ocean. And I'm disobedient to God, and they knew that. But he was so stubborn, Jonah says, I'd rather die than preach to the Ninevites. You talk about stubborn and not wanting to do the will of God. And so he says, instead of going back, he says, throw me in the ocean, for I can die. And they did. But Jonah didn't die. God determines ultimately when you will die. So God prepares a special fish for Jonah. Swallows him up and there in the whale's belly in the midst of whale vomit and gastric juices. He prays and asks God to spare him. And he prays the word of God back to God. And God spares him on that third day. That whale, that large sea monster, has a stomach ache and it beaches itself and it just barfs out Jonah. Jonah comes out of smelling like whale vomit. His skin most likely is dyed white. So he looks terrible. And yet now, now he will do the will of God after God whooped him and spanked him. Jonah should have did the will of God to begin with. It was clear. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You know it is good and it is right to obey God's will and his word. To not to do it is sin before the Lord. 
Like Jonah, we are responsible to do the will of God, especially as we come to a new year. What is God's will? Let me give you three applications of God's will as we close. It is God's will for you to be sanctified. It is God's will for you to be sanctified. The word sanctified means to be set apart. So in the temple, a bowl was said to be sanctified when a bowl was no longer used for Cheerios, but it was to be used in the temple for the service of God only. To be sanctified is to be separated from sin and to be separated unto God for His service, to love Him. It is God's will that His people be holy. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification that you should abstain from fornication. This is God's will, that you be sanctified. It is God's will that you grow in Christ-likeness, that you stay away from anything that is sexually perverse or sinful. Stay away from that and be sanctified. Grow in holiness. This is God's will, that you be sanctified that you grow in holiness as a Christian. Secondly, it is also God's will for you to serve. It is God's will for you to serve. Paul's writing to the church in Rome, in Romans chapter 12, and he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Him, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It is reasonable that you stop being a worldling and start serving God. It is reasonable that you give your life to the one who gave his life for you. It is God's will that you serve him. This is God's will that you serve him, that you grow in sanctification, that you serve the Lord. And thirdly and lastly, it is God's will for you to be saved if you are unconverted. 1 Timothy 2.3 tells us, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, We'll have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. It is God's will that a person stop playing church, that he repent of his sin and embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. It is God's will that you not perish in your sin, but turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't, as one wise preacher put it, a life without the Master in the end will end in disaster. You must come to Christ. It is God's will. I don't know. Does God God want me to turn from my sin and believe in Christ? Well, there's God's will right there, the Word of God, to repent and to believe the gospel. And if you're saved, to start growing in sanctification and in service to God and to others. The famous missionary C.T. Studd wisely wrote, Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your precious word this morning, for these four humbling truths given to us in your word. How brief is our life, how uncertain is our life, and how clear is your word about your will for us. Help us, Lord. In whatever time we have left here on this earth, to live it for your glory and not our own to be more concerned for the honor of King Jesus than than our own good name and honor. Help us, Lord. Grant us a love for the lost in this coming year. May we be a faithful witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, as we enter into 2019, that your people here at Emmanuel Baptist Church would be found faithful, striving to live for you for your glory living not only not for the things of the world, but the things that are eternal, that will matter in eternity. Help us that we would not live like practical atheists, making major decisions in our life without consulting your word, without bowing to the lordship of Christ. Help us, O oh God, as we examine our own lives under the preaching of your word. As our heads are bowed, let's take a couple of moments to pray, and let's talk to the Lord with regards to his word, this morning to us. Let's take a couple of moments to pray.